And now Daytime on 2 continues with some blues and rock and roll at The Rock School. <laughs> most instantly recognisable sounds in rock music, the bars of a slow blues sequence. Rock music vocabulary begins with the blues, not only because it uh, initiated two major styles, rock and roll and rhythm and blues, but also because it permeates just about everything that you hear in rock today. Now whatever the sort of music you play, it's worth your while to have a good look at blues, and we're going to spend the next half hour just doing that. We're going to look at the way it's been put together, and we're going to look at the way that blues has been a major influence on rock all around the world. The power of the blues lies with the emotions that the music unlocks, and this is due to a musical tension and resolution. There are three areas of tension and resolution. The first one is the solo voice, which is a vital feature of this style of music. The second is the chord structure and the bass lines that go with it. And the third is the development of the rhythm patterns. Originally, of course, blues grew out of the slavery of black people in the southern United States. It was just a vocal style of music. There were no rhythm patterns or backings. This followed on from an earlier vocal tradition of African music. When backings were devised, it was the guitar that seemed ideal to match the expressiveness of the vocals. Now, there are two elements to this. One is the notes that are used, and the other thing is the techniques that you can use to give these notes expression. Now the notes are very simple, there are just five different notes in any key and we call these the blues scale. Now I'm going to show you all the examples in blues scale patterns in the key of A. This is a very popular key in blues. So I start with the A note on the sixth string and this is how it sounds. Now let's extend the one octave blues scale up another octave. So I'm going to play the same notes, starting on the note of A. Now I'm going to play the whole two octave blues scale. But of course on the guitar you can play notes in different positions. So you can play the blues scale in different patterns. Now guitarists usually call these box patterns. Now the two octave blues scale we've just been looking at is usually the first box pattern that you learn. The second one is like an extension of that blues scale. So again in A it would start here on the third string. And the third box position has its root note on the fifth string. And again, it's a completed blues scale, going up to need two octaves. Once you've learnt these patterns and you can join them together, it means you can jam for hours. Now, we're going to look now at a great blues guitarist, the late Freddie King. Now he's just using the five notes of the blues scale mainly and in just one box position here. 
but you never think it to listen to him. is so powerful because of the tension between the minor nature of the blues scale and the major feel on the backing, particularly on the keyboards. But of course it wasn't just the notes that Freddie was playing or the box position he was using, it was the way he played them. And we're going to look now at some techniques you can use to make the notes more expressive. Now probably in playing blues the two most important techniques are vibrato and string bending. They're usually used in conjunction with each other but I'm going to look at them separately so you can see exactly how they're done. Let's look at vibrato first. Now if I fret a string, a note in the blues scale, <coughs> you'll notice that my hand position is different than usual. I've got my thumb much further up and the neck is really lying between my first finger and my thumb. Now to get a slow, even vibrato, you need to move the string from side to side of where it would usually lie, so you're shifting the pitch of the note up and back down again. It sounds like this. Or faster. This gives the note a lot more sustain than usual. And we'll try this now out with the group, and you can see how this sounds, just using the notes from the blues scale. technique we're going to look at is string bending. Now on the guitar you can bend a string anything from a semitone right up to two tones. On the blues scale there are two notes in the scale that are most commonly bent. It's the fourth which in A it would start here on the third string and this note is usually bent up a tone so from here to here and you also bend up the seventh note which is this note here and this is bent up a tone as well, so from this sound to here. Now I'm going to bend the string, I'm actually gripping the neck with my hand and I'm going to use the same technique as with vibrato, that is to rotate the wrist so that my hand, my whole hand will move. And I'm going to use my third finger to bend both these notes like this. And the seventh note. Now I'm going to incorporate both the techniques now, string bending and vibrato, and I'm also going to slide the notes a bit, because these are all techniques which will make the blues scale sound a lot more expressive. guitarists use these techniques generally to imitate the power and expressiveness of the vocals and this approach to rock soloing has become very popular through guitarists like Eric Clapton and Jeff Beck who brought the blues to a much wider audience in Britain in the 1960s. We're now going to look at a clip of a guitarist who influenced them and who has spent a lifetime trying to make his guitar literally sing. This is the incomparable B.B. King. 
Now the last part of the blues is the chord structure. This came originally from various forms of white folk music and at its simplest consists of three chords played over a 12 bar pattern. Now these chords are often called the 1, 4 and 5 and to find out how they got their name we've got to go back and look at the A major scale. Now if I play the major chord on the first note of a major scale I get the chord of A major. If I play a major chord with the fourth note of the scale as, as its root, I get a D major. Now this is called the four chord. If I play a major chord with the fifth note of the A major scale as its root, this is E major and this is called the five chord. So far in the series we've looked at major and minor chords, but we've yet to look at seventh chords which are actually a very important part of blues guitar. Now to form a seventh chord, you take a major triad, which is the first, third and fifth note. In A it would be this. And add on a flat and seventh. Now, in the 1-4-5 sequence, the fifth chord is nearly always played as a seventh. So let's look again at the 1-4-5 in A. One chord, A major. Four chord, D major. The five chords, this time it's E seventh. And you can hear that this chord sound produces a sort of tension which is resolved by going back to the one chord, the A major. Now chords can be very useful when you make up bass lines. Now even if you've only been playing for five minutes, you can still have a go. First thing you do is find out the low strings of the guitar chord because they're exactly the same as on the bass. Deirdre's playing an A chord. And so you find your A position, which is here, on the E string. And then you follow the root of the chords, like this. A, then D, then E, then D, and then A. Now all you've got to do with your one finger is add a bit of rhythm. So we'll get some rhythm from Jeff. Right, now the next step is to find out what's in the guitar chords. There's a root, a third, and a fifth. Root, third, fifth. Against the chord they sound like this. And then you remember the finger shape that you've got and copy that when you move to your new root on a D, like this. One, two. That's for D, and then you can copy the same finger shape and play E major like this. Now let's add two more notes to that. Let's take the six in a scale and the seventh in a scale and add those two notes to the chord. So now we've got root, third, fifth, sixth, seven. Now if I play this in a 4-4, four, four, you'll recognize it as a walking bass line. Now the good thing about that pattern is that if you change the rhythm just a little bit and play it in unison with the guitar, you get some great rock and roll riffs. Right, so remember, learn a finger pattern for your chord and then you can copy that pattern on any position and you just, if you want to change the chord, you just do the same pattern but make sure you've got the right root note. When Henry was making up bass lines, he used the notes the fifth, the sixth and the seventh. Now, if we do that on the guitar, 
we move in A, we move the note of fifth, sixth, and the flattened seventh against the root note A, we get this familiar pattern. You can also add notes to chords as well. For example, you could add a fourth to a major chord and get a suspension, quite dramatic. Or you could play a ninth chord, which has got a more jazzy sound. We're going to be looking in more detail at chords like this later on in rock school. But for the moment, we're going to look at two guitarists from quite different backgrounds. They both end up playing three chord blues. But because of the way they play the chords, they produce quite a different effect. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Three chord blues. You know, you can put a lot of chords into blues. You can play all kinds of substitute changes and everything like I did there. In the you can have like, sort of like rock blues, which is, you know, that, that kind of stuff, Chicago blues, or you can have jazz blues, things like, uh, The third component of the blues, of course, is rhythm. But on the drums, as we saw last week, it's not just a matter of trying to be flash. Everything that you play here affects the arrangement and the structure of the whole of the rest of the music. And in fact, this can be shown historically because when you go back to the very earliest blues and rock and roll, there were no drums. And when the first uh, blues drummers in Chicago were drafted into the bands, people like Odie Payne and Fred Bellow, they had all sorts of problems to contend with. Wandering time, 13 bars instead of 12. And eventually, they nailed the rhythm down, and they were very largely responsible for structuring the 12 bar as we know it today. Now, in early blues, there's a triplets feel running all the way through it, which gives it the sort of swing that uh, is similar to jazz. So instead of uh, the four beats of the bar being divided into two, like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, four twos, we get four threes. So you get one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. And it's played at different tempos in different sorts of music. And of course, different tempos means different moods. So we're going to have a look at a few uh, different examples of what you might do on the drums. And we're also going to see how it affects what the other instruments play. So, starting with the slow blues again. In this, the bass drum follows pretty closely what the bass guitarist is doing. Not too closely though, otherwise it gets a bit stilted. You've got to develop some sort of communication feeling with your bass player. Also, the ch snare drum on two and four, the guitar goes that, goes along with it, chops on the two and four. So you get this sort of sound. Now, as the tempo picks up, we get into the area of shuffles and boogies. Now, if you're not playing too loud, one nice idea is you can shuffle with both hands together. In fact, the whole band can shuffle together, and you get this sort of thing. One, two, three. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, and as we go up to really fast tempos, we get into the area of rockabilly. You can do this in a country manner like. But more interesting, you can play with both hands on the snare drum. Again, the guitar follows the snare drum beat. There's a beat like this one. Now, all these uh, fields have got a triplets uh, feel going through them. But as you saw last week, the other big influence on rock music is Latin. And this is uh, most obviously shown by the uh, straight eighths beat on your hi-hat. So that instead of this... You get this. The other thing uh, that comes from Latin, we talked about last week, the clave rhythm. We're going to do a bit of really classic rock and roll now. Uh, and the guitar lick that Deirdre's going to do, very much Chuck Berry influenced, in fact is based squarely on the clave. I'm sure you'll spot it. One, two, three. <laughs> shown you how flexible the blues structure is. No two guitarists will play a blues riff the same, so you can actually build up your own personal expression using the blues scale. And that's why it's so popular. Blues means something different to everybody. We're going to look now at a guitarist who's actually got quite an unusual style. This is Wilco Johnson, who came to fame with the London R&B band Dr. Feelgood. Come on in the kitchen, get the guitar, Wilco! Wilco seems to manage to play both lead and rhythm at the same time. He almost sounds like two guitarists. So we went and asked him about his style of guitar playing. The chords I use are generally uh, sim simplified shapes. This shape is familiar to most people. G. Um, I play this this way generally, which is the top four strings of that chord there like that. And I put my thumb over the top to make the G. And the, on the fifth string is in fact dampened by the thumb. The rhythm is sort of just, the, the right hand is just kind of doing this. With the back of my nails uh, going downwards, uh, and with the, th with the thumbnail on the up upwards, so it's just, just going, going across there really. Uh, and then I kind of blend in this little riff here. So if I'm going to do it slow down, it just goes... We're going to end the programme with another British band who play blues-based music. The sequences are still 12 bars using the 145 chords. The lead lines come from the blues scale. This is Status Quo, playing the classic Caroline. Thank you. 